This is the Free Hill Life Podcast, episode number 189. I'm your host, Josh Madsen, coming at you from the Free Hill Life shop in Salt Lake City, Utah. And it's Monday, everybody. Telemark Pirate Radio is back, and I'm happy to be here. Hope you had a great weekend, dropping knees somewhere around the globe. I know it's finally snowing in a lot of places, and the smiles are big, and people are enjoying some fresh turns finally. But even if it's not snowing where you're at, I'm sure you're having a good time. If you're telemarking, it's good. So let's hop right into it. I've got some newsroom and notes. We've got a busy week here at the shop. Most of our appointments have been booked up, but we do have some left on Friday and Saturday. So be sure to check that out at the service section of the website at freehealllife.com. And you can book a drop off for mounts, remounts, tunes, all that good stuff. I am going to be out of town February 5th through the 14th. So the brick and mortar shop in Salt Lake is going to be closed. And we're taking our protector demo fleet along with our boots all the way out to Midwest Telefest, which is happening the 9th through the 11th at the Porcupine State Park in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So if you've been following along on, on the social media, I've been posting about that for quite some time. We always love going up there. It's the 34th annual. And the thing that I'm most excited about is to finally get to ski the Free Heel Life Glades, which is a gladed section of that mountain maintained by our good friends at Midwest Telefest and Keith Opperman, who I've had on the podcast. If you're not familiar with that event and you're somewhere nearby, drive on up. We're going to be having a little shindig and it's going to be great skiing, demos. We've got the smelly knee pad. Uh, giant slalom race, which is always a good time with some classic gear on. And they've got a nice dance party with Pertnier Sandstone, a sweet bluegrass band. And we're going to put our dancing shoes on and enjoy the higher love dance party. I can't wait. It's always fun to go up there in a beautiful area of the country. If you've never experienced the UP, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, you got to do it. Don't forget World Telemark Day, first Saturday in March, March 2nd, it is happening. I'm going to go through a couple of the ones that I did last week, but as more and more are coming in, I want to make sure that you go to the uh, shop and events locator on freehealllife.com. You can find it in the top navigation. And I am putting not only shops that carry Bluebird stuff, but also all of these events so you can find all of the details. But I wanted to just mention them here real quick and I'll fire them off. That way I don't jam it up at the beginning of the podcast every week trying to read <laughs> insane amount of details about where to meet up. But at least I can give you a heads up and then head on over to freehealllife.com to find out the details. If you have questions, hit me up at podcast at freehealllife.com. And if you also want to put a meetup together, uh, definitely uh, email me at that same email. And I'll make sure to mention it on the podcast as we start heading there. We're a little over a month out. So let's make it happen. Starting off in Finland, here in Salo Ski Resort near Tur Turku, Finland. We got Massachusetts Berkshire East, East Ski Resort. I can't talk this morning. Jeez Louise. Uh, California, Mount Rose, Maine, Pleasant Mountain Ski Area, Minnesota, outside of Duluth, Spirit Mountain. And those are the main ones I've got right now. So if you've got a meetup, you know something's going on and you're going to be doing it for World Telemark Day, doesn't matter, um, does not matter how small or large it is. Let's do it. So today's guest has been a friend of mine for over 20 years and is a telemark skier that I've always respected for his great style, backcountry proficiency, and determined and skillful competition skiing. He was always a top performer in the early telemark free ski competitions during, during the early to mid 2000s and graced the big screen, not only in the early tough guy production movies, but also as one of the original Powder Whore crew during the 10 years that Powder Whore was producing movies as well. We had a great discussion about Telemark competition and film history, his inspirations early on as a young Telemark skier, and his experiences and life lessons along the way. 
So please welcome to the podcast, Andy Jacobson. All right, Mr. Jacobson, welcome to the Free Hill Life podcast, man. How's it going? Excellent. Thanks for having me. I'm stoked, dude. This is good. I'm digging up the old bones. Yeah, I know. I'm, like I'm ex- excited to catch up and dig up some of those bones. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is this is super fun. I uh, it's it's been cool because I'm I'm kind of I mean I jump around for sure in the in the history of Telemark stuff, but I feel like I'm kind of getting to the early 2000s, and uh, which is crazy because that's like 25 years ago, dude. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you're well aware yes that's funny um i got a funny name i pulled up out of i i tracked this down I, let's see if you remember okay i tracked i tracked down armand dubuque oh yeah the binding guy the binding dude. yeah what was that binding yeah. called i can't remember off the top of my head the, the ultimate telemark binding that's right yeah the Ra- rasta yeah it's it's funny i uh I tracked him down. I mean, some of these guys, it's so funny. Like I get their phone number and I text them and they're like, uh, what? Like you want to talk about what? what? <laughs> you care about that? That's so funny. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I do. I'm probably the only one. Yeah. Good, good to meet I you. I never met that guy. <laughs> oh, so he was even before your time, huh? Uh, I mean, he was like, seems like he was around, the the era when I started, but I just never, I never crossed paths with him. Yeah. I think he pieced out kind of like early two thousands. That and, sounds uh, right. He was like, that's what I'm similar with like the early days of rainy. I feel like that same exactly, era. Yeah, he and I talked on the phone. Yep. Yeah. We talked about super loops for a second and, and, uh, I think he's going to do the podcast, but it, it was, uh, um, I didn't really, cause he skied a bunch of stuff with Andrew McLean. Like, yep back like mount no. rainier stuff like yeah. in the 90s yeah yeah yep gnarly stuff super gnarly yeah yeah that's crazy um right on man well thanks for doing this it, it, you're definitely a person i wanted to get on here and and uh chop it up with so um i guess i always like to start with kind of like where you're from like you know people that may not know you um you know t- t- Tell people kind of like where where did you grow up and stuff. I always like to kind of set the tone of like how you got into the outdoors and stuff. And and um, yeah, tell me a little bit about it. Sure, uh, I grew up in Salt Lake City. Um, I have a fairly active family. My mom especially is super into hiking, and these days more just walking. But um, I grew up with her dragging me out through the woods, hiking, and then skiing in the winter. Um, kind of fell in love with skiing as a teenager. Um, and then, you know, once I was out of high school and had a little bit more freedom, really started skiing closer to like, you know, full time started skiing pretty much immediately, like close to a hundred days a year. It feels like at about age 19, um, maybe been a little bit less than that, but um, and just fell in love with it. Got hooked up with a really awesome crew at Snowbird in like the early 2000s had some awesome influence from super hardcore like snowboard crew that i learned a ton from and then we still had like you know back in those days andy hunter was like you know the pinnacle of telemarking in the wasatch that i knew of and i got to follow him around and try to keep up in like the early days um snowbird had a pretty pretty good uh tele crew back then there was uh, like mike roddy and I don't know if you remember him. He was he was kind of just before our so. time. So he was when I got into comps like early 2000, he was like the old vet. So he had been on like I saw him on TV in like an IFSA comp like all decked out. Oh, those old like the old Crested Butte yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was on telly all decked out, full pads, just like, you know, huge dude just like ripping through these gnarly like billy goat lines. Um, that's where I first saw him as a kid. I randomly saw, I was like, there's a tele skier and IFSA comp. This is insane. Right. So he was like, he was kind of the old comp master. Like he knew, he knew how to pick lines. Like he knew how to ski fluidly. He knew how to like stay in control. And he wasn't, he definitely wasn't like, you know, the most athletic or dynamic skier by that point. I think he was a little bit later in his career by the time I met him, but I learned a ton from him about competing and strategy and 
picking your line and all that stuff because he was kind of like the old guru at that point. Mike, Mike, Roddy. Mike Roddy. Yep. Yeah. He was a chef at Snowbird. I don't know what he's up to. I haven't seen him in forever, but he was quite a bit older than me. So he's got to be, you know, he's got to be up there in his fifties or something now, maybe older. Dang. Okay, cool. See, this is why I like to do these because there's like names that pop up and I'm like, yeah, huh, yeah. I've never even heard of this person. Yeah, you that's know? funny. I went on a trip. Like it was kind of a turning point for me, either 2000 or 2001 went out to a, I think a basin. Yeah. We went out to a basin with, it was random. It was me, Sarah Clemenson, BJ Brewer and Mike Roddy. We all drove out together and like got a cheap hostel together and like rallied together. And that was like kind of my first real immersion into like ski culture. <laughs> Is a like you know nineteen year old <laughs> on the road at a at a comp and you know they were letting me into the bars and all that stuff. I was like, huh. Oh, that's yeah, that's oh, I love that. So w- did you? Okay, so because I think we're did you graduate like ninety seven yep, from high school? Exactly ninety six. Yeah, ninety seven. Yep. Okay, so did you start telemarking in high school? I did. Yeah. Yep. How did how did you even come across it? Because I mean. I mean, we're the same age and I remember back then, I mean, I, I was over at Brighton, but you just didn't really see a whole lot of young people on telemark gear back then that were like in high school age, probably more like you're saying 18 and up. Yeah. 18, but yeah. So, I mean, I grew up skiing, you know, Brighton solitude, snowboard Alta. And so I'd seen telemark skiers at Alta, like good telemark skiers on leather boots, like ripping through the moguls. Right. And definitely remember being, as a kid, being inspired by that and being very interested in that. I had no idea, like, how I got from point A of being on alpine skis to, like, point B of being on telemark skis. Um, But in my Mm. teenage years, I I was lucky. I had a friend who his dad backcountry skied, and then I got a job at Wasatch Touring. And then I had another friend, and his uncle was actually, man, I can't think of his name right now. If I remember, it might have to edit it in. But his uncle was like an old Wasatch Telly racer. Um, you oh, you might know him. He was the he owns Soup Kitchen. Oh, dude! Oh, what is that guy's his name? last name's Aiken? Um, Greg. Greg. Aiken. G- yes, Greg Aiken. So Greg, I was friends with Greg's nephew, and so no yeah, I went up with Greg on weekends, Saturday or Sunday. I'd hop in his truck with my with my friends. And we you know shredded around, and we were on like, dude. I mean, I don't even know. I don't Riva twos maybe, and like, I don't know. First version T ones. It was kind of like that era, and just following him around, and he immediately installed in all of us. It was like, there's this is not an excuse to suck. Like, you got to be able to hang. <laughs> <laughs> like this is that totally is. That's totally him. Yeah. Like that kind of attitude. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. No. And I, and I, that like stuck with me forever. Right. And that was a big thing for me and telemark skiing. It was like, this is not an excuse to suck. Like I'm not doing this cause like I'm not good. I want to be like really good at this and, you know, hang with everyone. I want to hang with the snowboarders and the Alpine skiers and like be in that same realm. I don't want to use this ever as like a crutch to not be a good skier. And he just pounded, yeah, that- pounded that into our brain. I love that you brought him up. And for for people that aren't from Salt Lake, the soup kitchen is kind of this, I mean, it's what it's not. It's a soup kitchen. And the original, I think it's still there, right? In Sugar yep. House? Yep. Yeah. I mean, that's that's funny because I, I, had, I had never crossed paths with him. And I was in there probably around the time I opened the shop. And I, I was sitting in the back and there was like this glass case and it had all these trophies oh, yeah, in it. Oh, yeah. So like I walk, I walk over and I'm like, what the hell are all these telemark race trophies <laughs> doing here? And I'm like trying to like ask people and they're like, oh yeah, it's Greg. And, and, uh, and then he ended up being a customer and coming in here, uh, later on. But yeah, uh, man, that's crazy that that's how you kind of cross paths with it. That's, that's that's cool. Yeah, no, for <laughs> sure. It was that that was I was lucky to cross paths with him, honestly. That was kind of like what set me on this trajectory. I don't think there's any way I would have ended up where I was in Telemark skiing without that base. Um, pretty much, you know. Yeah. That was that was all my like kind of formative years were following him around Alta, you know. Yeah. I just did a podcast that came out um last week and 
kind of a similar situation at, uh, this, uh, Canadian ski guide, you know, worked at a gear shop, you know, and there was like a guy at the gear shop that telemarked and he was really good. Mm -hmm. And that was, so I love hearing sort of like how that gets passed on. And even like you're saying, like not an excuse to suck, yeah. you know, like yeah. that's, that's so, that's so badass because I think it's, it's, those guys were good skiers too. Absolutely. I mean, there was like a bunch of really good technical skiers yep. from that era. They were racers. Like, and, you know, we don't even, I mean, there, um, there's a few, but we don't have a bunch of people with like good racing routes anymore. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Like it, it's, it existed, but that scene was pretty big too. Like when we were in high school, they had the whole Wasatch Telemark series, totally. uh, racing. Yep. I mean, I did one probably in like 95 or something. Oh, nice. Did you ever race? No, 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 no. I did ski across once at Crested Butte. Like they were doing some oh, yeah, telly yeah. fest. Oh man, it was hilarious. I, uh, yeah. you know, it's just like, whatever. At mass start, everyone starts. And on like the second turn, I was on like, dude, Rosenberg had some straight up race skis. They were like GS race skis, right? So I was on like GS race skis going around the first icy corner and just like my skis are ripping the corner. I'm like, wow, this is awesome, right? And this just like, dude, sorry, but like stinky hippie on his like dull Dina Star big skis comes <laughs> and he just like he loses his edge and takes me out and like the two of us and we like grab another dude, go flying through the fence, like off oh, the side. Yeah. That was like my one ski across oh. experience ever. And oh, that's so funny. Yeah. yeah I I randomly did a was I don't even remember why because I didn't know any racers but I think I was trying to find uh I was I was trying you know as a younger kid you're like trying to connect with like that new thing that you find yep. and I I think I I don't know if you remember tuna news it was yeah, like oh yeah uh, I think tuna's still around it, yeah it's like a what does that stand for it's like the Utah Nordic, Nordic Alliance, yep exactly yep yeah yep. and I think there was a thing it was like wasatch telemark series i'm like oh cool i'm gonna go race and but it was uh i'll never forget because i had to buy vole releasable crb binding yes to be able it, to race it, yeah because they required releasable binding i and, like, remember, I remember that I, I tried to ski on it and there was like a width requirement you couldn't be over a certain width hmm. underfoot um to keep it like traditional telemark because if you remember I don't know if you ever felt this way because you were skiing with a pretty good crew. Um, I remember I bought a pair of K2 Extremes and mounted Riva Ones and like some people were like kind of dogging on it. Like they're like, dude, you can't mount wide skis, yeah. you know, like yeah. you got to mount telly skis. And I'm like, what? Cause, but there was, I mean, it's like always, right. There, there's always like some dissenters of the group, you yeah. know, oh, as for things sure. progress. Yeah. But, uh, well, that's cool. Okay. So Greg Aiken comes in the picture. You guys are skiing with him. And then, so you're already telemarking in high school and get out. And then you're like, I'm going to be a ski bum basically and ski yeah. my face off. Yeah. Not necessarily immediately. Um, I, like my whole life I've been very into rock climbing and I was still very stoked on rock climbing and still am to this day. Um, so I was kind of like dabbling, just doing all the things, you know, living my life. And it wasn't until dude i think like there was the first brighton comp was like 2000 mm -hmm. so i would have been like 20 years old i think is when like the first brighton comp when i was like oh i entered that my first run it was hilarious my first comp run ever right i don't know anything about line choice or anything right but i'm like i know i can ski faster than all these guys like that was my like thought process going into this thing so i just picked like a pretty clean line like no errors in it no difficulty and i proceed to like take a digger twice that I get like I was like second to last after run number one. My friends were mocking oh, me. No. Yeah, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that was just the learning curve, you know. After I like watch and I saw the scores, and I was like, okay, so line score is like very critical. And like you know, started that started the whole process. But that was my entry into telemark scene. But I think the second run, I had like the third or fourth highest score of the whole comp. And that to me, I was like, okay, I can like hang with these guys. That one, like I'm trying to remember who won that one. Maybe Andy Hunter. I think BJ Brewer. Did won. BJ? No. I don't know. Oh, 2000. BJ Brewer I definitely to... won one of them. 
for yeah, sure. I might. I think there was like two comps. I had some results. I was trying to pull up some of the old results. Oh, you have them? I have like, I should give these to you. I literally just pulled them up for dude. this. Cause I was like, dude, I got to do a little research. I don't remember all of this stuff. Um, that's, I've been trying to collect results. I need, I need some time to like build a binder, but yeah, I'd love a copy because there's some, there's some cool, cool history of like who were at those things back then. Yeah. It's, it's I, cool. Ultimately it, you're the guy that it needs to end up just in like a big spreadsheet, you know, totally. it would be yeah, cool like, to have it all. It would be a lot of work for sure. Cause even going through some of these results, I was like, there's no, there doesn't even say like, what is this? What day, what comp, you know, it's just a <laughs> bunch of scores and names, you know? Let's go through. I'll show it like, oh, yeah, I'll show you. Look at these scorecards. So this is like 2008 Telemark oh, Free oh God, Champion. Scorecards? Yeah. This is like. Damn, that's sweet. JT sandbagging me, you know, like what other. See, <laughs> I've got. Here we go. This is probably one of my best scorecards, nines and tens. Oh, that's sick. Yeah. I mean, it's, okay. it, yeah. 2011. So paint. Mountain Hardware. Oh, no. Targi. Oh, dang, dude. Yeah, I know. I can't believe you have all that. Well, I just, have a, I just have a folder, and I just, you know, I was like, ah, before this, I should just bust it out and run through it and see if I can remember. Like, oh, yeah, I was at that thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Uh, okay, here, you got to paint the picture of what Telemark comps look like in 2000 because, I mean, when I watch video from back then, I mean, it, it, and I think this is sometimes I get shit online because like, I'll, I'll, I'll say, Hey, you know, there's videos out there and like, I watch the skiing mm -hmm. and you know, I, I think we come from an era, like we watch ski videos to get inspired and pumped up. Right. Like, yeah. so I, I think that's like, that was just like how we grew up. You had Greg stump movies and then you had like the early matchstick stuff. So I think in my, my mind, I want to, you know, we're old dudes now. I still want to look at like something new and be like, that is, that is above and beyond, you know, where it was. It, those comps, the footage from those comps back in 2000, I mean, it's, it's crazy to me and like how good one, technically people skied also like people went really fucking big, you know, and I don't know, like paint, paint the picture from your perspective though. Cause you were, you were there and competing. So, yeah, I mean, I think it, it progressed rapidly, honestly in, in like 2000, right. This was like the beginning of fat skis. So people were, we were all just kind of like starting to scratch the surface. I remember that first, very first Brighton comp I went to, I was on Rosignol bandit double X's, right. And I was too scared. I was too scared triple? to get the triples, right? Because they were huge. They were 85 millimeters in the waist. And I was like, that's gigantic. No way do I need that. I'm a Telemark skier, right? So I got the okay. double X's. And they were like, for, you know, back then, they were like pretty badass. They were pretty good skis, you know? But definitely, yeah. like looking back now, of course, you'd want at least the triple, right? But yep. I think as skis progressed, those comps got, in my opinion, way better. You know, and, and the skiing has always been, you know, pretty solid. I, I don't know personally that I like saw it progress. I think that like some of the early Andy Hunter stuff I saw was like just as good as anything I saw from the later generation, you know, Jake Saxon and Nick DeVore and those guys crushing, you know, those guys, they're not to take anything away from any of those guys, but like. I mean, I think the best Telemark ski run I've ever seen in a comp was Andy Hunter on Silver Fox and North Shoot IFS, I'm sorry, IFSA comp. I don't know, like 2001 ish, something like that. He it was a qualifier at, 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 Snowbird. at Snowbird. So his home resort. And this is like, so that he, you know, had been skiing Snowbird year in, year out. He skis that run probably like, you know, a couple hundred times a year. Right. So, but he absolutely destroyed it. Like, Came into North Shoot, two big turns, fall line with a bunch of speed, aired, you know, like 30 footer, landed like he just, you know, came off a nice roller on a groomer, hauled through the trees, like hit an air 360, I think, at the bottom, stomps it like it's nothing, you know. And I, I don't remember if he won it, but he was like top three in that qualifier that day with that run, you know. So it was like, you know, we haven't really, we've seen like Nick make it to a final, Dick DeVore made it to IFSA final. 
think Jake did too, right? Yeah, Jake did. Dylan did. On Telly Skis? Dylan Crossman. On Telly Skis? Yeah, cr- oh, actually, I don't know if he I know he for th- sure did on Alpine. I don't. I honestly don't know if he did on Telly. He may have. I, he that, definitely had the skill set too. That's a hazy one. Yeah. I don't remember. But, but yeah, Nick there's and been, Jake I mean, sure. not, a, not a lot. Yeah. And I don't know that Andy Hunter yeah. made it to the final in that one. I don't think he did. But that run like stands with me as like one of the greatest telemark ski runs I ever witnessed anywhere. You know? Huh. I love that. Well, and I may I maybe the thing that I always think too is the equipment choice of that era and then how they were skiing on the equipment. Because yeah. like you said, there was kind of that was probably that next generation of like, do we use fatter skis or not? And then the the big thing for me is bindings. Like the boots were like pretty good at two thousand ish, you know, because that's like Bumblebee for sure. era for or sure. t- t- like T Race. But a lot of guys were still skiing like targets. Oh, you know? I know, like I know, that, I know. Which is crazy. Yeah, you know. Yep. And it required a lot more technique to pressure the skis than a modern binding would yeah you know yep so yeah that's that's cool man i love that you're bringing these names up because see i don't even know andy hunter i've heard that name but i don't know yeah he was you know like the generation before us a little bit he i mean yeah he had an accident he hit a tree at snowbird and ended up losing like more or less like the use of one of his arms so he skis around now with one pole dude he's still shredding like shredding i'm not kidding like i have a hard time like keeping up with i haven't seen him in a long time but the last time i skied with him i was literally having a hard time keeping up with him and he's like literally doesn't have use of one of his arms it just kind of like hangs there and he just shreds down the mountain wow yeah that's 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 incredible yeah well i yeah so i mean just i that brighton comp like and then that this this is kind of when i start meeting you guys Mm -hmm. is probably around 2002 like um, cause I wasn't really a big mountain competitor guy, but I went to that Jackson hole event in, I think 2002, uh, or 2003, somewhere in there. Cause, cause then USTSA had started kind of the, the, tw- like the, like a, not a tour. Yeah, no, they did it? that. Like that a, was, but that was 2001. Was it 2001? I don't know. Let me look. I think so. Yeah. Here, Ken, pull, I have it right here. No, uh, no, you d- see, you're helping me out, dude. I don't have any of that paperwork. <laughs> uh, let's see. Jackson Hole. Yeah, there's three comps. Jackson Hole, February 23rd to 25th. Brighton, March 17th through the 18th. And it was supposed to be a basin, but it got changed to Berthid for the last comp that year. W- which year was th- that? Would be two- the McClory thing. That would have been uh that man oh i got dq'd from that one for time you did yeah the day i skied like this awesome line probably one of my this is probably my best comp run ever skied this stupid insane line over like next to this 80 foot cliff and actually got through it okay came down to the bottom had this air picked out there was no inspection so i kind of just like inspected this thing found this like booter that sent me over like this goalie so I just kind of like pointed it towards this thing, like had no idea of the speed. It was like, okay, just go too big. If anything, go too big. Hit like one of the biggest errors of my life, like jump errors, like definitely like a 40 foot gap, stomp it. And I like get down and they're like, oh, you missed the time cut off by 15 seconds or something. I was like, oh, bugger. But yeah, then the next day, that was that was the comp that the McClory thing went down. Yep. That was yeah. also the comp. And that was <laughs> Scott Murray. Do you remember him transferring over onto that, that was bin? Gnarly. That was yeah. Super I do gnarly. remember. Yeah. Like lookers left from the bottom. Exactly. Lookers left, and he just aired yep. across. Tried to land on this little fin, and it was just rock. And I don't know all the snow. I remember all the snow just sheared off, and it was you could see the rock. Yeah. But it, I don't know if you remember that. seeing his like hip and butt after that. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were staying with him. So I remember he was like in our hotel. I was like, I mean, it was just like blue and green and black and purple. And like, it was, it was gnarly. He got wrecked. Obviously not bad as Scott McClory, but yeah. Do you know? That was, yeah. What's up with Scott McClory? Is he, you know, you know anything? No, I would love to get, I would love to get him on. That'd be an interesting one. Cause 
See, that's what's crazy about those competitions, right? Because like he's Canadian. There was like Canadians no, I know. come down and compete he was with you ripping guys. too. I remember skiing around with him yeah. and being like, "Oh, that again, that guy has like a race background, right?" And right. just skiing around the resort, I was like, "Whoa, this guy rips! Like he's not just some like free skier, bro. He's got like a really good telly turn." Yeah, for sure. No, that's it's crazy because all the all the names that you're saying, it's like. Scott Murray was another one of those early IFSA guys in Crested Butte. Yep. Yep. Um, you, you know, I mean, there was like a lot of history and and those guys had been competing in Nats events like early on at a basin and birthed. Um, I had him on the podcast. That, that's good to know. You've got some results. Cause I think, I think at some point it'd be interesting to sort of timeline it out a little bit. And, um, but yeah, the, the level of skiing was, pretty wild i was your line lookers right yeah kind of- yeah 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 so that thing that murray tried to transfer over onto it would have been uh-huh. well no it was lookers left it would have been lookers left of that there's like a big like 80 foot cliff that i actually i yep. skied in to inspect that and i was maybe gonna hit it and i as i like peeked over it looked really flat and i was just like no no not doing that so i made like another turn and had like a plan b kind of a line um but yeah, I mean, this was like early days of having cameras, but I still remember like the footage of me making that turn on that 80 foot cliff and like snows cascading off and it was like, oh, it's pretty exposed up there. But Oh my God. Well, it, it, to explain a little bit about, you've talked about what you learned to compete in those things. Like for people that have never seen a uh, free skiing comp and especially that era, cause it's still kind of new, right? Yeah. Like the the televised Alpine events were going on in the nineties, but you know, that's only like maybe, I don't know, five, not even 10 years before Mm -hmm. you're talking about it. Yep. So like what all went into line inspection and like, how did the scores work and all that? (laughs) I mean, it depends on what day and what comp and who was running it. Yeah. What judge and (laughs) what the conditions were. Uh, I mean, in general, they tried to get you an inspection, right? Cause that would be safest for us all to be able to go look at these things, right. Before we try to shred through them, but sometimes conditions or other things would get in the way where we just couldn't do it. Um, I do. I mean the final at birthed, were you at birthed? I didn't know. So this would one. have been like supposed to be like the grand finale of that first year of the USTSA when Jeff Wright put on the series and yep. we're supposed to be in a base and I can't remember why, but we went to birthed last minute. And the qualifier was on like some little mini golf stuff that's within the resort. But the final dude, they sent us like they would, this would never happen. They sent us into the back country, like up this ridge to this peak. <laughs> we skied off of like a peak and we skied this big mountain line, probably 1500 to 2000 vertical feet with a bunch of different cliffs in it with zero inspection, except for the hike up. Right. And it was like, we well, it- go ahead. I, I was just going to say like birthed pass wasn't a resort at this point. People got to remember there was no lifts. Right? I think this is like right when they had started running that one lift. Oh, they had, okay. They had, so you didn't have to hike. Oh. No, they had one lift for like the qualifier, this little mini golf kind of cliff zone. But it was, I mean, the qualifier was like a 200 vertical foot zone. And so they took the final and I think they were like super, they only took like top 10 or something. They were super careful about who they sent up there, but we literally booted up this peak and, you know, on site, no inspection, ski down these lines and, you know, nothing happened, which is kind of a miracle. But I think Sarah won that <laughs> one, if I remember right. I think she did. Too. That's so, it's like so loose, dude. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. we got the insurance guys. You guys are fine. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> insurance? What? I mean, is there a birthed ski oh. patrol? There's got to be something, but I don't know who was making these decisions back then. And everybody's just like, were you fired up or were you guys like, well, we were stoked out of our mind. I mean, it was like a good day. It was like good conditions, like venue looked beautiful. I mean, we were stoked. It was, it was awesome. It was one of my most memorable finals ever. Probably the best conditions I've ever had on a final run, but it was just, you got one run and there was no inspection because it was in the back country. It was like one and done. And it's just intimidating, you know, trying to ski aggressively down something you haven't really looked at and kind of have an idea where you are, but like I, you know, generally I like to have like a, a marker, like a tree or a rock or something. So you 
very confident that where you're going is where you think you're going because obviously we've yeah. seen bad things happen in comps where people are not where they think they are. Um, yeah, that's that's wild, man. Yeah, I wish I could have seen that. <laughs> that was fun. That was super fun. That's cool. Um, well, so at what point? Because the comp thing, that's like I said, that's where I met you, Andy Rosenberg, Noah Powell. I don't know Jonah. Jonah didn't compete. I don't think. No, but uh, no. But there was like that was kind of the little crew. At what point did you guys start filming? Because, um, yeah, I guess walk me through that because it was a really different time back then. I mean, it wasn't like, I mean, now our iPhones shoot better quality video <laughs> than like the camcorder things. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Was it? Because I think it was through, didn't you guys start filming like little miniature segments for Nat Ross for Tough Guy? Yeah. So I think the first Tough Guy film I was in was in like 2003. I think it was like Bliss. You remember that? It was like me and oh, AJ. You were in Bliss? Yeah. Yeah. I was in like their okay. all, their like first four movies. Dang. I didn't realize yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, Bliss. I, I so, think I might have found a copy of that finally, but. I mean, I don't really have any great skiing in there, to be honest. Whatever. <laughs> but yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. There's like all these weird, obscure movies now. Yeah. That's like, oh, bliss. Like, I would be fun actually to go back and watch it. You know, 2003, like, dude, I guarantee I haven't watched that since 2003. You know, totally. it's been 20 years. It I, would be kind of interesting to go back and watch. Yeah. You're, it, yeah. I mean, you're like a young dude. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's cool that it got documented because, they, those, Nat was all about like, I've talked about this on the podcast, like the three chip camera. I don't know. If oh you yeah. Remember no, that, totally. That, was, that like, was it. That was like 2002, right? 2003. Yeah. Like that happened. And then Steve Soderbergh like made a film with the XL one S. Remember that Canon? You remember that camera? He made oh, like oh, a yeah, feature yeah, yeah. length film with a three chip camera and everyone was like, all right, it's on like digital's the way. Yep. Right. And so, totally. yeah, around that time, Noah and Jonas, totally, I hadn't even met those guys yet. They had bought us like a GL2, a little smaller Canon camera, and they were just filming themselves like skiing pow at Deer Valley and in the backcountry, right? And then Rosenberg, I don't even know why, but Andy Rosenberg bought one of those XL1S, the nicer Canon. And so, as I, and I was living together with him, and so as like a 20-something-year-old, we had this really nice camera laying around. And we filmed all sorts of like nonsense in the summer up at Andy Rosenberg's ranch and like used it for fun. And then in the winter, we started pulling it out a little bit at like comps and stuff. And that's where I don't remember what year it was, but I would, I would say like probably like 2003. That's where I met Noah. Was it uh, Alpine Meadows comp? And we were, I want to say we were all just either staying in the same place or maybe we just met there, but he kind of like showed us his like powder horror film and we're like, cool. Oh, we have a camera. We should like ski more. And that was like, that was the beginning of it. That's great. I didn't realize you didn't know each other earlier. So mm -hmm. did, did you and Rosenberg like yeah. grow up together? Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. I, okay. I've known Andy Rosenberg for quite a while. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. I always think it's funny that Noah and Jonah were like Deer Valley guys. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like the most unsuspecting place. Like, <gasps> Yeah, we we're we we're from Deer Valley, yeah. and I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> no, that's actually my first memory of Noah is hearing his name at a comp announce, like Noah Howell from Deer Valley, Utah, and just being like, <laughs> who's this dude? Like, there's really a telemark skier in Deer Valley that thinks he can compete. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. And then we, uh, that three chip camera thing really was a big deal. Cause, and I, I think I talked to Nat about that because I remember hearing, I think I, I, uh, briefly lived at Charlie Cannon's house and I, he was kind of linked in with that crew. The one down down? Yeah. That Victorian house. <laughs> was he uh, digging out the basement at the time? Uh, were you around for any of yes, that? Yes. Kind of. Okay. Uh, I, I was not there for the digging, but okay. that basement was creepy. Yeah. Yeah. It was creepy. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny you know that house um no but i remember meeting nat and it was like yeah like if you have a three chip camera you can just send footage and i'm like what is it I, like I, i'm like what's a three chip camera i didn't really know much about it but yeah that's what was kind of interesting about those movies because he kind of had these little groups 
oh, that had cameras totally, and they would just like send it in and then they would put these movies together. Yeah. You know? I mean, dude, do you remember Dusty? Dusty was so rad. You remember that guy from Tough Guy? Early days. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know who you're talking. Yeah, yeah. Dusty for sure. Yeah. He was like a yeah. kind of an atomic Nordic guy. Yep. Um, ultra runner. Like yep. total hardcore dude. I didn't even know it back in the day. But he just like spent the winter following me and Ross Richards around Alta. It was like oh, me and great, Ross and that's Dusty. another great name, <laughs> Ross. Ross Richards, bro. <laughs> I have oh not seen God. that dude in a long time. I'm gonna track that guy. You should. Down. I would he, love to catch up. That guy is that guy's super OG for sure. And someone actually, Ross Richards, uh, I mean, really was like a an early pioneer of like park skiing for sure. Like, and he was Very a great, early. great skier, but like. He actually had like legit tricks and stuff. Yeah. And someone actually, I didn't realize he was in a um, Gaffney uh, film, right? A ga- the Gaffney film. Yeah, yeah. Winter Park. Someone sent me, yep, someone sent me that clip totally. where it's like he's in the dish room. Oh, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, funny. yeah, yeah. That segment's it's, sick. It's a little, yeah. <laughs> it, <laughs> I was like, someone in, sent it to me on Instagram the other day, and I'm like, what? I'm like, I've never seen this. I was like, I don't know if this might stand the test of time. Like the, it's, it's kind of a funny, uh, a funny moment in that movie, but the skiing is sick. I'm like, this is crazy. This is like 1999 or something. Yeah. He's doing like court sevens. Nobody stuff. knew that anyone was doing that. I did not know that anyone was doing that on tele skis when he was doing that in winter park in that video. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I remember sure. seeing Ben Dolan's throw like a rodeo at a, uh, I can't remember what it was. A basin comp. Not during the comp, but just like after. And I was like, yeah. oh, I've never seen that before. The Kelly skier just stomped a rodeo, but the, Ross was doing it like four years earlier and yep. higher difficulty. And nobody really yep. knew except for a couple of dudes skiing around Winter Park that saw him in the park. Yeah, that's, I had no idea you guys rolled together for a well, while. Well, he, uh, you know, he like showed up at Rosenberg's <laughs> house and just like never left the couch. <laughs> Uh, we had this like giant like growler full of change and we we just watched the change just drop like all it just came the inside joke with me and all of our roommates we're like just keep an eye on it it's like know where it is now and like none of us are touching it right but this change thing is just like dropping slowly but surely you're doing like little markers yeah we (laughs) little little sharpie mark sharpie mark (laughs) no he'll notice he'll notice but no, we oh, literally so had to like, funny. I'm pretty sure that we all like pitched on a train ticket and I drove him to the train station. It was like, yeah, dude, dude, like it's time. Like You took him to a train station? Uh, yeah, he was like, That's dude, he, I mean, he spent the winter <laughs> not paying any rent on Rosenberg's couch and we all had like put up with it as long as we could. And like, I mean, this is literally probably the last time I saw him and like, I don't have any hard feelings towards him. We were all just like young and like we were living that lifestyle, yeah. right? Um. But yeah, I'm pretty sure that me and Andy Rosenberg and one of our other roommates pitched to pay for his train ticket because he didn't have any money to like get back home to Winter Park. And we like, I drove him to the train station. It was like, yep, here you go. That's so funny. Yeah, it was the end of the winter, so he didn't really have any reason to be here anymore. I don't think. Yeah, but yeah, wow, that was the. the, So go ahead. No, I was just gonna say. So, so you guys. So that was kind of the first thing, like Dusty followed you guys around and, and you guys were sort of filming and stuff and doing the early tough guy. Yep. Um, so when, when, and you met Noah and Jonah, like when, when did the idea to do, cause this is kind of like when I meet you guys, like this is probably like 2004 ish. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess when did the idea come from the original powder horror kind of group like hey we're gonna make our own movie well that was actually before i ever even met noah so noah and jonah and like daryl finlayson and the whole deer valley crew they had like a little you know short movie they had made and it was called powder horror right it was never like released Mm -hmm. right but i saw like when i met noah he played it for us and i like saw it right so that was they had like a little 10 minute or 20 minute pow video that was called powder horror before I even met Noah. Um, Hmm. And then, yeah, I think it was like 2003. And at that point, like I said, I was filming with tough guy 
And then 2004, I kind of filmed with Tough Guy and Powder Horror. We were like, oh, you know, we had somewhat decided that we wanted to make a film. And that me and Jonah and Andy Rosenberg and Noah were all going to combine powers and like see what we can do, right? Because, you know, what we saw coming out, like, no offense, but like Bliss and Core from Tough Guy were, you know, I was in them, but they were just, you know, we felt like we could do something a little bit better. As like, yeah. I think we all have always thought, you know, and I would say the same thing, you know, about Powder Horror now. It's like, oh, it could have been better, right? Yeah. So I think like 2004 was the first year that Noah, Jonah, Andy Rosenberg, and I started filming with the intention of making a film. And we had no idea really what it was going to become or how far we'd take it or if it was going to be a one time thing or what was, you know, we didn't really have like grand plans. I mean, it was named powder whore. So we were just kind of like flying by the seat of our pants, you know, just like young and dumb and just having fun skiing. But it started as like, honestly, we just went skiing with our friends. Like it was awesome. You know, there was no, you know, or very little concessions made for filming. It was just all about going skiing and we filmed it and whatever came out, came out. And then as part powder whore, progressed we realized that we had to make you know more and more concessions for the filming in exchange for like a higher quality product and you know you start to lose a little bit of the soul as you do that i think we were all aware of that i mean and you've experienced that of you know being a professional skier and filming and shooting photos it's different than just like going out and shredding a turn in the woods that no one ever sees and it was perfect and rad and good for your soul it's just different than than going out there and trying to get a good shot whether it's film or video it's almost like two different worlds you know like like you said like to and i i don't know if most of us i mean it really was a different era too because you think like social media is not there yet i mean there was still like analog um photography and and like we said the video cameras were just coming out that you could actually like get a commercial level picture. Um, but I think, uh, you could see the divide a lot too, of like people realizing that, you know, Oh, I want to be in the movie, but then you, and, and they, there was, there's a lot, I mean, like all these people were talking about, there's been a lot of amazing telemark skiers <laughs> over, over the decades that you, no one's ever even heard oh, of because sure. they don't want to stand around and, make it hey i need you to make three turns and yep. blow up blow it up you know yep so it's uh that's, that's a unique a unique thing i was i was gonna at least hold this up because i did have a copy oh nice yeah that's me baby cover shot yeah <laughs> pw5 yeah and and uh i think that's when you're skiing on atomics back then yeah, the right. uh, Telly Daddy. The Telly, yeah, the, yeah. and that, those were getting fatter by then. Yeah, so that fat. was like the Telly version of the Sugar Daddy, which was like about a hundred in the waist, but they only made it in a one eighty three. So Atomic was like my first ski sponsor, and I had been skiing on the Big Daddy, their Alpine ski, which at that point that was one oh seven in the waist. That was like huge for skis, period, and. Andy Rosenberg was the one pushing us like we need to be on that ski. So we were skiing 193 big daddies around Snowbird and they were awesome, right? They were freaking huge for the day and we were just loving them. And then when I signed with Atomic, they made me go to the Telly Daddy which was like a little skinnier and a little shorter, but still honestly a really good all-around ski. Like I I didn't mind it 90% of the time. It was like on the really big mountain deep stuff, I wanted something bigger. But that was yeah. still a pretty good ski. Definitely, in my mind, that was like really good telly ski for the period. Did they, was it the same construction, just graphic difference? Yep. Yeah, just a different top sheet. Yeah. And I think it's, they it's, had, I think they had like a binding plate on the Alpine one that they had to just put wood in the telly. Mm. What? I can't remember. What Were you skiing BD bindings back then? In that era? Uh, I was on Super Loops for a while. Whoa, really? Yeah, I was on Super I mean, dude, honestly, that era, there was an era where that was the best binding, in my opinion, by far. 
Yeah. You know, no one, no, I agree. no like, one else was even was... thinking about pivot point. Yep. And on those, you could mess with them, which was in my opinion, just mind blowing. Cause I, that... did you actually go ahead? Did you mess with your pivot point back then? Yeah. But, I mean, I worked at Wasatch touring, so I was like in the shop working on tele skis all the time. So I kind of was like geeking out about it and like, yeah, I definitely, I went all the way back on those and it was like, Whoa, that's too much. And that was the first time I'd ever experienced you know, I, what, what's the right word for that? I don't even know, but like heel tension Acti- too, too much. Yeah, we call it ac- activity. Yeah. Too much activity. I was like, that is too much. That's just, I can't bend my knee naturally. Right. And then I think I went back to like number three or something. It was like, Oh yeah, that's the huh. sweet spot. But oh, that's funny. You know, I skied Riva twos, but I just remember blowing my, the duck bill out like repeatedly you know, that, oh, because of the tat, because it didn't have the bar yeah, over the toe. Yeah, just like busting out, going fast and like busting out of those. I blew up a yep. pair of the Riva Classics. That was my first binding was Riva Classics. I like literally first day stepped in and with Terminators and exploded the spring. <laughs> <laughs> like the heel just Yeah, the heel just, the like the just... spring just opened up. It was like no more. It's like, oh, I guess these are not compatible with plastic boots. But, you know. Did you, did you do Super Loop? So, uh, funny enough, did you know about the Super Loop one that had a rubber band heel? No, the first Super Loop I remember had a cable and it had a heel closure and it had the spring in the heel okay. closure. Okay. Like a little That's like two. two or three inch spring and yep. not very much travel. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah. And well, what's funny is I always thought that was the first Super Loop and there's a, there's, I'll, I'll text you a picture later of, I finally found Super Loop One, which is it's literally it's got like hose clamps holding this like foam rubber heel and it has an actual grip that you pull to stretch the heel and put it onto your boot. Wow. Crazy. <laughs> Sounds crazy. I'll show it. Uh. I'll send it. You'll trip out when you see it. Anyways, no, Super Loop really was like that era that you're talking about. I remember seeing all the badass guys had super loops and super comps yep. or terminators. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Huh. I'm trying to think my binding progression probably went from the yeah, Riva two to super loop. Honestly, I think I stayed on the super loop for a while. I'm trying to remember. I definitely, I tried the Targa and just couldn't do it. Yeah. Uh, I tried the Lincoln. Remember that thing? That was probably oh, my least oh, yeah. favorite of all time. No offense if anyone's listening that likes Lincolns. <laughs> the uh, Lincoln guys are out there. Yeah. Like, Ronnie oh, Dahl. Suck. Remember Ronnie Dahl? No, I don't. What? Who's that? You don't know <laughs> Ronnie Dahl? Dude, you've got so oh, many good man. names. I'm like, who Who are these people? Ronnie, who's Ronnie Dahl? Ronnie Dahl is this crazy Norwegian. Uh, I don't know. I don't, maybe he's not crazy. When I, I only met him once, and it was at this Brighton comp. He was like the Lincoln like sponsored skier. And they like flew him out for like a Brighton comp early days, like early two thousands. And he had a bad first run. And so his second run, he just literally went straight like as, as a like, humor. And just, I, I, he just literally straight lined the whole venue until he exploded. <laughs> and like, that's my memory of Ronnie doll. It was like, so this is Lincoln's pro they sent over here. Uh, Hey, Ronnie Dahl, if you're listening to this, please email me. Yes. I, I want to podcast at freehealllife.com. Hit me up, bro. Yeah. I want to hear the Ronnie Dahl story. <laughs> yeah. I bet he'll remember going straight down the Brighton venue. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That, that binding was kind of funky. I have I have a couple. I actually have one in the box if you want to take it out for a spin. <laughs> oh, man. No, thanks. No. Uh, I mean, I what else? I tried the, oh, what was the big? Skyhoy. Oh shit! You did Skyhoy too? Nah, just for a minute. I actually talked to Andy Rosenberg into like mounting a brand new pair of like Solomon's keys with those, and like he exploded him first run top of the tram at Snowbird, like blue. Yeah, because it was those made no sense. They were so heavy, and it was like plastic at that hinge. It's got to be one of the, like the most most money put into something with the yeah. least amount of return. Yeah, it's up there. Poor Skyhoy. Skyhoy, yeah. <laughs> Man, that was a disaster. That's funny. I would have never, 
I never would have thought Skyway would have crossed paths with you, bro. Well, that's, that's... yeah, it was just for a very quick moment. You know, I got sucked into the propaganda or the marketing or whatever. It was like, this is the future. Yes. <laughs> it was like, no, no, no. I'm going back to the super loops. Step in 75 millimeter. This is it. Yeah. But I mean, once I guess when I left the super loop was when BD came out with the O2. Yeah. So Andy Rosenberg actually got hired by BD like right out of college for like an internship to go to New Zealand. And he helped kind of like dial in the O2 before they released it. So me and everyone, I, we were just like, okay, that's going to be like the binding. And it was really good binding in my opinion. And then when they yep. came out with the 01, I had never left. That's probably like my own personal all time favorite. Yep. You roll uh rid stiffs. Yep. 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 That it's, yeah, I had it literally, people love that binding, dude. I had a guy literally yesterday, I had, he hit, he snapped that front cable on it and uh, I go to take the cartridge off and it's like seized, you know? Mm. So I'm like, dude, I got to like soak this overnight. And here I am this morning, literally, I mean, this guy, he doesn't, he's like, I love these bindings. And I'm like, I, I get it, man. And I've got a lot of parts, but. 2000 i mean what was that like 2009 yeah that thing came yep. out yep yeah, yeah. I'm like, that sounds... it's starting to get it's starting to get to the point where i don't have all of the parts right and i had to i had to leave him in a sad message i'm like dude i tr i tried <laughs> i tried to make it tried to get it through but uh, it, i gotta it, dig uh... through my stuff i might bring you a box of 01 parts hey i'm, I'm in. pretty I'm sure in. i've got it the uh the cartridges are really hard to find. I believe that's that. Like a big, I believe that. That's a really tough, tough thing for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's cool, man. Well, um, yeah, that, that era of, I mean, so you did, I guess just to kind of wrap up the powder horde thing. I mean, I mean that, that was an era, bro. Like, I mean, you guys, you know, I filmed with you guys the first two years and then how they, did, you, did they go t 10 full years? 10 years. Yeah. Yep. 10 years. Wow. Yep. So 2015. Yep. Did you film every single movie with those no, guys? No, I think like the last one I wasn't really involved in at all. But I think yeah. I did like eight or nine of them with them. Yeah. Dang. It's dude. fun. I was, I, just so you know, I was the person pushing for you, demanding that you were in the first two. I, I appreciate <laughs> that, dude. I was actually telling someone, a fun, I, and that was such a great, it, it's cool to look back on that because... Yeah, I ended up being sort of like the park skier, you know. Yeah. You guys were really good. You guys were really good, and you hiked a lot, and I sucked at keeping up with you guys. Yeah, so yeah. Was... You were still a good free skier. Yeah, you just didn't – yeah, you didn't ski the backcountry as much as we did at that point. No. Well, let's hit on that real quick because one thing I think that's unique about Powder Horror, like you said, you didn't compromise a lot like for filming versus the skiing. The amount of hiking – that you guys did over the course of that that project i mean it, it like it weeded people out not oh, everybody sure. could hang with with you guys yep yep i mean is is that an accurate statement <laughs> oh for sure i mean i mean there are probably some other things that weeded people out too but that was a huge one some people just wouldn't even come out period that we wanted to film with because they were uncomfortable or whatever um, and then we definitely had other experiences where it was just like, it's just too much. And, you know, yeah. And uh, dude, it's hard. I, I mean, I get it. Like waking up at 3 a.m. and being at the mouth at 4 30 and hiking in the dark and, you know, all that stuff. It's, it's hard for sure. I also, like, in a weird way, loved it. You know, I, I, I don't remember ever like my alarm going off at 3 a.m. and being like, screw this. I hate my life. Right. You know, it was like, stoked yeah. that we get to go out and like ski pow in the mountains with good friends and like you know just appreciate that we actually had that chance to go do that yeah i know for sure hey, how many people when you guys were doing dawn patrols back in the day how many other parties did you see out there uh a few and then you'd like you would know that you yeah i mean here and there uh, yeah w honestly we didn't do a ton of dawn patrolling in like the central Wasatch, like across the street from Alta, right? Yeah. We've kind of like spread ourselves out to other places. And, st and that seems to be like, you know, if you're headed up Superior or Flagstaff or something like that, like 
early morning on a good day, that's where everyone's going to be. Yep. And, and we weren't there very often here and there, but I would say it's like one tenth of what it is today. You know? Yeah, no, for sure. What What do you think? Because you guys were the first ones that I knew where you guys were pushing out to zones here in the Wasatch that like, you know, obviously I didn't really grow up as a backcountry skier and I wouldn't, and not like you guys, you guys are a totally different type of backcountry telly skier. And, but there was like all these zones that I didn't even know existed. You know, I mean, do you have any like memories of like going out to some places where you were like, Oh yeah, this is sick. You know, like we're out where no one's going to be out here. Cause it, it, nowadays a lot of people push pretty hard further, but I feel like you guys were heading back there way earlier than everybody else. Definitely. I mean, I think, you know, we'd hike for sometimes two hours, get back to whatever Hogan fork or something, which when I started ski touring, you know, just getting to Hogan fork was like a big day. You know, that's how it was thought about like, Oh, that's like a, really big day if you're going to ski from the white pine trailhead and get to hogan fork and then either ski out hogan fork and deal with the bushwhack or hike back up and get back to the white pine trailhead that's like that was what i viewed as like a huge day in the backcountry and we just started doing that regularly you know because we part of it was chasing conditions so you know we're filming so we're looking for good snow and we're looking for light and you know we're trying to ski the steepest thing we can on a daily basis that's safe which is a tricky thing to do obviously and like as those words come out of my mouth now as i'm older and my risk tolerance is much lower i'm just like that just sounds stupid to say you know and i think we are incredibly lucky that no one died during that 10-year period because you know as much as I loved how we did it and how it wasn't a big crew, it was like there was times where we, we put ourselves out there and exposed ourselves because we were a smaller crew. We didn't have a helicopter or we didn't have a safety director on top. And, you know, there's things that these bigger film crews have that we didn't have. And it really required us to trust each other to a, a super high extent, you know, it, and and it was cool. It was honestly really unique group that we had, you know, core four of us that we all had that trust and we could all film and we could all ski and we could all assess avalanche danger and risk and all of those things. And we got along as great friends. And so, I, I mean, I honestly look at it as like a kind of a magical 10 years. It was awesome. That's some of the, yeah. the, the most fun I've ever had. That's amazing. Yeah. That's, I, I I think that's that's a cool point to hit on because I feel like how how much you guys would have had to trust each other and I mean that that's true I mean there was like I mean was there any like real close calls other than the superior thing during that whole ten years Yeah, uh, Andy Rosenberg definitely could have should have died on Superior. He took the ride from the top of like the dome all the way down to the apron through rocks, under snow, like, you know, super lucky that he lived through that one. Um, Noah was an avalanche in Days Fork that was ended up being kind of minor, but came very close to, like, dragging him into some trees. Mm. Uh, oh, man, Chris Erickson kicked off this slab in Alaska. He was kind of on a spine, and he – kicked it off one side and jumped onto the other and like where if you would have not gotten out of that almost certain death on that one and he you know he didn't go for a ride but it was one of those things like yeah sure he like hopped over that uh kind of spine thing he was on and got to a safe point and was okay but there there was definitely a moment where we all kind of like gasped um i'm sure there's more certainly will cardamone hit a tree just ski and pow fast ended up can't remember what he did he like bruised his liver or something but it, it was like borderline life-threatening you know and he had to be evacu self-evacuated out of the backcountry you know we've wow. the one thing that i'm proud of is we've always self-evacuated every single time there's been multiple injuries and we've always gotten ourselves out we've never had a helicopter or any sort of rescue operation ever in all those 10 years wow that's incredible i mean did you feel like you were uh 
how proficient before you started doing that much backcountry skiing versus like after 10 years? I mean, that's a, that's just a lot of, not like on the job training, but like, I mean, you guys like that, you must have learned an insane amount of information, you know, like you said, your risk tolerance now might be different, but I mean, all those lessons learned over those 10 years, I, I can't even, I don't have that much experience in the backcountry, And I imagine like you guys all being together, that tight knit group. And like you said, the ability to, um, assess situations correctly and then, you know, build a, build a basic risk profile where you guys can talk through and trust each other. And then if something does go wrong, like you actually have the ability to, to get yourself out, you know? Yep. Um, I guess, yeah. Like, I mean, did you just looking back, do you just feel like you learned insane amount of stuff, I guess is my question. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, I feel like it's been a, I don't know, kind of like I've been on a spectrum. The, you know, in terms of like avalanche education, I got my Abbey one when I was like 19. And then in like 20, it was honestly, it was right before that Rosenberg avalanche. Andy Rosenberg and I got our Abbey two up in Jackson. And honestly, I got my Abbey two and I'm like, I know what I'm doing. Right. You know, at that point I was probably 24 or something like that. And that was probably the most dangerous moment in my ski career in terms of avalanches, because I thought I knew what I was doing, but what I was missing was like this big, huge base of experience that you need to go along with the knowledge that I was just taught in this like three day course. Right. And I'd been backcountry skiing a bunch up to that point. I thought I had a pretty good base, but that same year, literally a month or two after, you know, Andy Roseberg and I both got our Abby two. And we're, you know, certified that we kind of know what we're doing in the backcountry. He got in that huge avalanche and almost died. And that was a huge wake up call for me. It's just like, okay, this is not, you cannot be smarter than these things. Like you have to, we have to find back the line off. We can't be walking the line every single day. And in all honesty, I think over the next 10 years, I just started walking my line back further and further and further and further, the more I learned. It was like the more I learned, it was almost like the more I just realized that we really don't know and that it's not a science and that you can decide when you want to roll the dice. And there's a lot of factors that go into those things. But, you know, these days, like I'm pretty much not going to go ski like a big open 38 degree face with bad consequences below it, you know, like maybe on a certain day here and there, but I'm more or less like, I want to go ski stuff that's like never going to slide. <laughs> like right. give me some trees and you know like there's plenty of ways to use terrain to be 100 percent safe in the backcountry and you know that's more where i'm at these days is just like let's like minimize our exposure to avalanches period there's tons of power to be had in these like safer spots and i still go I mean, like you know i'm not saying i don't go out and ski open slopes anymore because i certainly do when it's when it's safe but at the same time i have backed way off uh, like way way off like i said we were like purposefully walking the line every day trying to ski the steepest gnarliest thing we could and now i just want to go out and get some exercise and ski a little pow and come home safely is the main goal get some dad pow yep exactly it's all it's all it's a little bit more precious now that it's dad pow yeah for sure no i love that man it's uh it's funny getting older, right? Like it's, it's like you, it's like the old guys tell you stuff when you're young and it's just, it doesn't make sense till you get older and you're like, Oh yeah, that's why you got to think that way. But I think like you're saying, it's a lot of, it's, it's that cumulative experience over a long period of time. You know, um, I like how you said it's not a science too, because <clears throat> you can think, you know, any, I mean, whatever people are doing in nature, I mean, there's so many unknowns regardless of all the data points that you put together. Yep. I mean, yep. it, it, you know, you just, you don't know, you, you don't know what's going to happen. For sure. So yeah, that's rad. Well, I guess, um, I guess anything else you want to add on the powder horde thing? That was 10 years of your life, dude. I, I definitely wanted to touch on that. <laughs> oh man. Uh, I'm sure there's tons to add. I, I can't think of anything right this second. I mean, I, I, like I said, I think we were lucky that nothing horrible happened throughout those years. Uh, yeah. Thankful for that. Honestly, I, I was caught in one avalanche in all of those years, and it was just Jonah and I 
we weren't filming. We were just out ski touring. And that was like, what year was that? That was 11 years ago. So that would have been like 2012. Yeah, 2012. I got caught in an avalanche in Days Fork. Jonah and I had just skied two dogs. And we skinned back up what is the normal skinner kind of through the trees. And when Jonah got to the top of the ridge, I was just a little bit behind him. An avalanche was triggered and I was like 15 feet down from the ridge. And I got washed like through trees, like filled gold through trees, fully thought I was going to get folded in half on a tree and carried to the bottom. And that was a pretty big wake up call for me. The 32 year old was kind of like, you know, I and thought I, we were being safe. You know, at that point, I kind of thought I was pretty cautious. And then later that same winter or this next winter, a good friend of mine, Craig Patterson, died. He worked for UDOT. And he was probably the one of the most knowledgeable and cautious backcountry skiers I'd ever skied with. And so that's when I was really just like got just slammed into my head that like, look, this isn't something you can outsmart. Like every single time you're going out, you're putting yourself in harm's way and you need to take that mentality every single time into the backcountry. And yeah, since that getting caught in that avalanche and then Craig dying, I've backed just way off, way off. Yeah. Man, and I'm I, sorry to hear that. Yeah. That's, that, that's, yeah, that's tough too. I mean, yeah, that's, that's heavy. I think to know, I, I, I've never, I don't, I've never known anybody that's died in an avalanche, but it, it's always heartbreaking when you, uh, hear about that stuff happening, especially yeah. like really experienced guys. Like yeah. I mean, saying, he was, uh, like, he was a Abbey forecaster. He worked for UDOT. He was just out on a solo patrol by himself. And that's the other thing is like, so he's knowledgeable and out by himself and you know, he's being safe. Right. Yeah. And he still like still got caught. And that was for me just very eye opening and just really, I, I mean, I'm thankful to have those lessons, honestly. I'm just being yeah. like, okay, hey, if that can happen to him by himself when he's, I know he's being careful because I know him and I know he was being careful, then that for sure can happen to us anytime out with a partner, just letting your guard down for a second. You just, we just have to be hyper vigilant, stack the cards in our favor. <laughs> yeah. Dang. Good reminder. Thanks, dude. Yeah, no, sorry. Sorry. Not, not trying not to be a, bit, a downer. No, I don't, I don't think it's a downer. I think people need to hear that kind of stuff. Cause I mean, with how, how much people get in the back country these days, yeah. I'm always surprised. Oh, Cause I think, you know, I mean, probably the most I was skiing the back country was with you guys back then. I mean, it was like, Hey, we're going hiking, we're going hiking. And I, I remember, uh, uh, you know, it, there's a lot of IO, those eye opening experience. I remember, I, funny enough, I had forgotten when you were talking about going through the trees. I when we went to Cook City. Oh man! And that was like that was the first time where like we're getting it. No, like none of us really know the area, yeah. and I, I I have this distinct memory of we're skinning up through the trees, and I'm thinking, oh, we're in the trees, we're safe, like. And someone up ahead kicked off this massive slide that just ripped past everybody. And I was like, oh, I'm like, I'm not safe. Mm -hmm. Like, I, you know, so it's like, I think it's important to share the stuff you're doing because, you know, you hear these little sound bites of like, uh, if you're in the trees, it can't avalanche or something like someone will say something like that. And it's like, like you said, you never know, like the, every scenario is so different and unique and there's all these variants involved. And I just remember that happened and I was like, huh, I'm definitely not experienced enough to know what's going on here. You know? Yeah. That trip was gnarly. That was gnarly. <laughs> that was, no, it really was like the Abbey conditions were bad and we still like pushed into that little mini golf zone. And then that last day we skied off that peak. Like yeah. I was the first one off that peak. And honestly, I look back at that line with like a tiny bit of regret. I'm like, man, I kind of feel like I was probably pushing it a little far there. Yeah. Like we well, all ended that, up skiing that line and it didn't slide and we were okay. Right. But like I was saying, like, it's not a science. We didn't know it wasn't going to slide without any question. Right. And I certainly, I remember making my first three turns, like super carefully kind of ski cut, ski cut style, you know, 
trying to be conservative, yeah. but also, you know, Will's taking photos and it's like, oh dude, Will Wisman, like I want to shred, right? And it's, that's again, yeah. that's like the beginning of these decisions that we make, making movies and videos that maybe are not in our best interest, but you know. Well, and I, I, th- I think about that too. Like back then we, there was always kind of this discussion about, you know, like ski cutting, you yep. know, it's like, you know, if you're shooting a video, you know, maybe it's so funny. It's like dumb. You think back and it's like, yeah, you're like, I, I just want to, I just want to drop straight in and rip it. Yep. And it's like, I'm just going to skip the ski cut. It's like, you look, <laughs> looking back, it's like, what the hell were we thinking? Like, cause you don't know, like totally. you could drop in that first turn and the whole thing just goes, you yep. know? Yep. Uh, yeah. That's, that's an interesting dynamic for sure. I got it. I got to ask you, I, I realized I hadn't touched on this. You got to walk me through Medusa's face, dude, because <laughs> this, this is like, and I know, I know we're probably going a little long, but oh, I'm good. Th- that, uh, I, ex- <laughs> I don't even know how to introduce this, man. I remember seeing the photos of this from Will Wisman and just like looking at it. So I guess just a quick description. So like growing up in Salt Lake, you know, obviously the Wasatch is here. There's a really prominent mountain called Mount Olympus. And there's a huge slab of rock on one side that's like like a 5-4 quartzite rock climb. You know, like it's it's easy enough that, you know, it's, it's not like a hard rock climb. Uh, but and I didn't realize until I saw these pictures of you that you can ski this thing <laughs> and sometimes snow sticks to it. So like, what was, what was, how did you even come up with, was it, is that a shooting gallery thing? Like, how did you come up with that on your to-do list, I guess? Uh, yeah, it was in the shooting gallery was kind of the, the beginning for me. Um, I definitely like when the shooting gallery came out, I was like, bought that book and I was stoked and I was like, okay, I'm going to go start ticking off the easy ones. Right. And that, I mean, I don't remember for sure what year that was. I feel like it was like Oh one or something, you know, but Medusa's face was one of the kind of crown jewels in that book of the Wasatch in terms of like difficult ski mountaineering lines and growing up in the Salt Lake Valley, I've stared at that face my whole life. And so for me, I was very inspired by the thought of, getting it in good conditions and like making ski turns down that face. I, I I don't know why I don't, I can't explain that inspiration, but it was something of like almost like a childhood dream kind of a thing. And it was something that I'd had in the back of my mind for a long time. And then this year, probably Oh five or something like that, we got this really nice low elevation storm and that face filled in. And I knew like, you know, I'd been watching it for a couple of years at that point and never had seen it really fill in. And so I knew this was our chance. And so, yeah, we blasted up there with Noah and Will and Andy Rosenberg. Um, and Andy actually, he brought like, he brought some giant rope up there. I think that we had the idea that he was maybe going to like belay me way down the face or something like that. So I like tied into this rope at the top and ski cut and like ripped off like a little like six inch slab kind of slough thing. And it just like cleaned out the face. And I remember Will and Noah saying they like, Oh yeah, it's like, it's done now. He's not going down. There's no snow left or whatever. But in all honesty, like the avalanche had just kind of compacted the face. And now there was like this nice, slightly firm chalky snow left the whole way down. And uh, yeah, I just remember staying tied into whatever Andy Rosenberg's rope for like a couple hundred feet. And then it was like totally getting in the way and untied from that and ended up skiing it in really good conditions. It, honestly, it wasn't like, it wasn't pow, but it was like this nice chalky kind of bed surface from the little slough avalanche thing that had like cleaned off the face. And wow. in general, I think that that can be kind of like a sugary rocky face. And I had it like pretty nicely compacted and, like edgeable it was pretty much like perfect conditions and it was it was super fun i mean it's it's a it's definitely like no fall zone from the top to the bottom you know and i I wasn't skiing it fast or anything it was just you know very technical jump turns one after another the whole way down i still like i 
I might even have like a low res picture of that, but it's epic. Like, and I think it's when you have that rope on. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I'll, I'll see if I can dig that up because I would love to see it. I do remember one of Will's photos when the slough was running down the face yep. and like I'm at the top and I'm just this little dot and there's this giant slough running down the face. It's, that's the one I remember, but I haven't seen those photos for two years, two or 20, 20 years, something like that. Yeah. I mean, how do you know, do you know how many people have skied that? I think a bunch of people skied it last year with the massive winter. Really? Yeah. Yeah. People were getting after it. Um, but up yeah. to that point, like I didn't know anyone that had done it when I did it. I'm sure someone had, I would assume, I don't know. Um, but I mean, huh. you know, this day and age with Instagram and everything, it's like, yeah, I saw a bunch of people do it last year, but it was That's in so for like a month straight last year. Whereas like, you know, usually it's in for a day or two but yeah. last year, just so much snow. I think people were getting after it. Dang. That's what. And was there video of that or just photos? No, there's video. Yeah, it's in one of the early powder horse, either PWO5 or PWO6. I can't remember which one. Huh. It's the, you go. remember Noah did those? Uh, it's like a, it's a take on Masterpiece Theater with Andrew oh, yeah, McLean yeah, 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 narrating. Yeah, yeah it's, in, totally. it's in one of those, it's in one of those segments. Okay. I, I, okay. I do, re- I do vaguely remember. I remember the Masterpiece Theater. That was pretty yeah, funny. Yeah, Classic oh, Noah that's stuff. Re- no. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, the humor in the early ones was, like, so funny. Yeah, Noah was a, yeah, he was a class act. He definitely had a talent in that world. Yeah. Well, so, um, I guess, before we wrap up, man, what are you up to these days? Like, I mean, you spent a decade being a powder whore, and then, like, what do, what have you been up to since then, you know? Uh well, I've got two kids and a third on the way. So oh, congrats. Thanks, man. We're going to uh zone defense here shortly <laughs> <laughs> in March. They're officially uh, outnumbered. Um but yeah, I ran a small bouldering gym up in Park City for about seven years. And we closed that in twenty nineteen. And for a couple of years, we had been trying to do like a full service climbing gym up in Park City. And we just recently pulled the plug on that project due to some permitting mm-hmm. hurdles that were unsurmountable. Um, so, yeah, I'm actually kind of trying to figure out what I'm going to do from here forward. But I've been working in construction this last year and for a large majority of my life. So I'll probably end up doing something in that genre. That's awesome, man. Yeah. How? Uh, you but, hiring at the shop? Are you? Are, <laughs> uh, the thriving the thriving telemark shop that's right maybe we should maybe we should start building stuff i mean yeah. i'm doing real estate bro so you're in the, you're headed in the same direction i that i am yep. so <laughs> yep. Yep. um i was gonna uh are you climbing a bunch still then yeah i mean obviously if you okay yeah are you how how is it are you climbing are you climbing a lot of trad stuff or are you bouldering uh, i mostly doing? boulder and sport climb these days. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I like, you know, grew up climbing in little cottonwood. So I grew up climbing trad and slabs and all that stuff. But these days I'm stoked just to go clip bolts and, you know, I spend a lot of time in American fork and then bouldering in little cottonwood. Kind of my main two climbing areas here. Climbing the limestone, huh? Yeah. Climbing yeah. Bolts on limestone. Yep. Yep. I love AF. It's the best choss pile ever. <laughs> greasy, greasy choss. I love it. Man, I, I thought about that. We, we, we were up bouldering like in little cottonwood a couple years ago. And it's, it is, it is funny, like how high traffic it is now because oh, man. a lot of the, a lot of the classic problems, like you're like, Oh, I'm just going to get on like standard overhang. And it's like polished Please. to the point where you can like see your glass. face. In it, you know? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's glass. It's yes. glass. And you're like, well, this isn't like it used to be back in the day. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty wild, man. Yeah. You can show up at like the five mile boulders now and there will just be literally the grounds covered with pads and you don't even need to put your pads down. You just start climbing. Cause there's a group there of 20 people. Oh, it's so like, wild. it is, it is, it's pretty wild. We, to uh, see. we did. We did track a black Bible down. Nice. I've got one. You do? Yeah. Yeah. Rad. Pristine. I, we, we, 
Really? Yeah, yeah. Well, I had one. I, my original one that I like had a bunch of notes in. I lost one day. It's in Little Conwood somewhere. I was so sad. That one I lost like four or five years ago. And my friend actually had a literally out of the box brand new one, and he gave it to me because I was so sad of losing my like. It was kind of my climbing journal for Little Cottonwood. When I lost my oh original my Black Bible, yeah, it was really sad. But I learned the lesson to not keep your climbing journal in a guidebook. Smart move. Yeah, it's in an Excel yeah. spreadsheet now. <laughs> oh, there! <you>, wow, <laughs> very new age. Yeah, for yeah, what what we're talking about? There's this book. There was this old guidebook called it. I, it's not called the Black Bible, but that's what everybody calls it, and it's got all these. And what I brought it, why I was bringing it up is it's got a lot of these uh, areas that I think someone tried to develop early on and then they like no one went back. And yep. so we kind of started realizing, oh, OK, a lot of the the classic spots are kind of overrun. So, like, let's try to go. I mean, there's some fun. There's some interesting, weird. I, I don't know if it's all great classic climbing, but there's some fun random boulder problems out there that are not touched and overgrown again and oh for it's, it's sure kind of tons yeah 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 that's cool man well you'll have to come down by me man come to joe's valley i love joe's yeah come to joe's and uh i think we went out to triassic not too long ago too so that was kind of fun i love triassic too there's a lot of potential out there yeah, you can just wander. Yeah, no, no, the no people, dude. No. You can come back to where there's no people. No, you might see some <laughs> scary, uh, scary locals. Yeah, <laughs> I had some scary run-ins in Triassic. I'm not gonna lie. Really? Yeah, just like weirdos in their truck rolling up, being weird. You know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Keep it spicy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's funny. Well, dude, I, I, I so appreciate catching up with you, man. No, it's, it's been really fun. Great to chat. Talking. Yeah. And, uh, wish you all the best on the, on the new one coming in hot and Thanks. hopefully, uh, all the other stuff works out well too, but I'm, I'm psyched and it really means a lot to me for you guys to get on and share a lot of this history, man. And, and like, I, I, I suspected you've, got paperwork and all sorts of names i've never heard and that's that's what makes it fun for me yeah so yeah all right brother cool well, man talk to you soon and uh appreciate you being here yeah, talk to you next time to catch up see you, josh all right later